three. Hello, everyone. Um, what is it today? Today is the Friday. Yes, it's about is. 2 p.m. I believe in Toronto, 4 p.m., 5 p.m.? 5, 5. 5 p.m., three hours ahead. My guests today are two lovely couple. Uh, they're good partners. They're good friends. Uh, they've been to everything. And uh, in fact, I need to ask them because I do remember meeting them, but I need to ask them if they remember meeting me when and where, you guys. This is Gio and Kim, by the way, from Toronto, ladies and gents. <laughs> hey, friends. You want to tell them? I don't know what year it was. Oh, I don't remember the year. Either. Okay. I don't remember the year, but I do remember that it was at the Toronto Bachata Congress, was it? Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. Toronto Bachata Congress. It was yeah. 2013. 2013. Was it? Yeah. 2013. Yeah. yeah. 2013. Was it August? End of August. End of August, yeah. End of I August. Think that was the time. I remember that was the time I first saw you guys perform with Aragoku, Aragoku, you know? Yeah. With your team. Yes. You are wrong. I remember uh, United Salsettos invited me for a workshop. And then we okay. went to this, uh, before, the work, before the event, we went to this social. And then this uh, good looking woman. Uh, asked me to dance. Yes. And so I danced with her. It's like, she's dancing like Dominican. What the fuck? You know? <laughs> and so we had fun time dancing. And all of a sudden, then she introduced me to you, oh. <laughs> to oh. Gio. Yeah. <laughs> then that's, that's the very first time I remember you guys. Uh, uh, oh, uh, Gio and At that time, you weren't planning anything yet. You, uh, you probably had a vision already, but you weren't planning anything yet. Maybe the plan is on, is on the works of, of all of your ambitions and whatnot. I can't believe you remember that, man. I'm 75 years old. You're 12. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't believe that you remember that. Seriously. You know, uh, I got selected memories, but I do remember almost pretty much everything uh, in fact, you know, I get a lot of interviews. They interview me. When did you start dancing? When did you do this? When did you do that? Amazingly, I do remember. <laughs> you know, but how's everything? It's as good as can be. I mean, uh, like, we have our health, which is number one. Yeah. You know? you know, we have shelter, we have food, we have our family, our family is doing well. So in that respect, definitely we cannot complain. Definitely not. Um, you are, know. You both, are you both working uh, in a non-dance type of job? Oh, no. We're oh, dance no. Full time. <laughs> we're dance full time. Not full time right now, but... Yeah. Nah, not right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, we've definitely been affected by everything that uh, has been going on with uh, sure. COVID and the pandemic. Um, so in that respect, it has been a little bit rough. Absolutely. Um, but uh, made it we've, work. yeah, we made it work. We've had to, you know, transition, shift, yeah. adapt, learn new skills, learn lots of new skills. <laughs> How is this uh, online classes going for, for you guys? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. Actually, it's going pretty Did good. Actually make money. Uh, we're, well, yeah, it's, it's been doing its job to sustain us a little bit for sure. But it's not, it hasn't been our primary focus, to be honest. Uh, we really wanted to shift gears and, you know, set ourselves up future-proof our lives, given that, you know, we, we have all learned so much from this past year. So we have shifted gears a bit. We have focused on dance. Jill's been doing 365 days of Mambo videos on IG. I've uh, seen those. I've seen those. And we'll talk about that later, later on, because I want to. I gotta actually look in the archives to see some rachata salsa videos. That <laughs> I know, I gotta... right? <laughs> He's like, please don't. <laughs> I don't have many. I had, I had so many. Well, you know, at that time when I was dancing, you know, there were no smartphones, there were no instant videos and whatnot, and so you had to actually edit, download the videos and whatnot. So I used to have a camera guy. Uh, his name uh, is. Uh, <laughs> Sound like DVDs? His name is Jack, and he used to take a lot. The, the young pictures that you see me on, he is the one who's been taking those pictures, like the karate kick and all of that stuff, uh, even videos. And, and, and uh, uh, without getting to, we had a falling out, so 
those videos will never come out. <laughs> the guy hates me. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, he used to be my like media guy at that at that time and in that era because in that era there was it's not as easy as this guys, you know. But, uh, uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know, uh, Kimberly, uh, last name Kimberly? Ramos. Ramos, yeah. Uh, and then Giovanni. Giovanni? Giovanni what? No name. Gomez. Giovanni is, what are you? Uh, no name, no name. No name. Although my, my, my mother's last name is Gomez. So not wrong. So, so what's, your na what's your heritage, I should say? Oh, okay. You go ahead, ladies first. Uh, well, we were both born in Toronto, Canada, but my father is from the Dominican Republic and my mother is Colombian. And my father is from Guatemala and my mom's from Colombia. Jeez, you have some Colombian blood there, both of you, huh? 50% yeah. Colombian with yeah. both of us here. Yeah, yeah. You know, one, of, one of the things I admire, both of you, I admire you guys. For one thing, Gio first, uh, I think he is not a human being. Uh, uh, I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> I mean, I'm not talking about chata. I'm talking about mambo. I'm talking about salsa, you know, where he, he does that epilepsy. I'm not, you know, I'm not making fun of epilepsy people. He does that epileptical, whatever move that he does. I think it's genetics. I don't know. But then what I admire about Kim, Gio, is she keeps up with you, dude. <laughs> she can keep up with you because I, I can't do it. <laughs> you know? Tell you something about Kim. Oh, Kim yeah. looks at me like, she's like, Looks at me like, you're crazy. But then she just jumps in and all of a sudden I'm like, she just, she <laughs> pretends like she can't do it. But she just one time, two times to jump in. She, she outdoes me and then I'm like, that's not true. I'm like, really? <laughs> you're talking you know, about there, there was a time where uh, Frankie Martinez were the uh, flavor of the year, okay, in my era. And yeah. everybody imitates him. No one can imitate him. The guy cannot be imitated. You know, uh, he, all of the things that he used to do w in his day, I mean, it was almost impossible to do it. I've seen the way he taught workshop. We could not get it. We were all advanced, but we could not get it. But Kim here, <laughs> when you do your thing, because when, when you do your thing, bro, it's like, there's no way. I, I can't do this. There's no way. There's no way people can do this, you know. But Kim keeps up with you when you guys perform. You do all this thing. It's like, geez, that's a that's a pretty good teamwork you guys got. <laughs> we definitely balance each other out. That's for sure. For yeah. sure. I'm the like, I'm the crazy the wildfire. One. You know, like <laughs> I am the wildfire, and, and Kim's more the you know calm one. But you know, Kim has her time too. Oh, so. yeah. she, has her time. she she has she has her swag. <laughs> She's got, she's got all the swag for both of us. And then she looks at me like, no. 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 <laughs> and I'm like, really? Yeah, because those 360 videos you do, I mean, what the? Sometimes, you know, the one, the one I think, I'm not sure if you're inspired by, what's his name in, 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 in Oregon? What's his name? Uh, Benny and Brandon? Brandon? Yeah, Brandon has... You guys almost have the, the, the same belt in the lower body because I'm trying to analyze why you guys can do this, you know? And it's like, it's those muscles from the lower body that <laughs> you get so. all of the short, I don't know, man. I mean, you tell me. <laughs> Honestly, it's because I'm, uh, my center of gravity is so, so low. low? That yeah. I <laughs> <laughs> so rooted <laughs> into the ground. At I have those roots, <laughs> not not you know, the only guy that I can think of that 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 you guys have certain similarities of structure is Brandon, dude. <laughs> I love Benny and Brandon, and they're like they're great friends of of ours, yeah. and and uh, I mean like I look up to them. These guys are super young, man, and, and yeah. I look up to them. I'm phenomenal. So yeah, we're we're friends, and we always talk and. And we, we help to inspire each other. They inspire me so much, you know, for and sure. we get to talk sometimes when we're in festivals. So for sure. For, sure. Uh, for you guys, when it comes to Mambo and Salsa, are you guys, because you and I both know uh, when it comes to the bachata scene, and I'm talking bachata scene, and then I'm talking Salsa Mambo scene. Uh, mm -hmm. They're two separate uh, uh, communities. Yeah. Now, Without filter, how are you guys accepted in the Mambo Salsa community? Because they're a bit territorial, in my opinion. So, um, Honestly, we have been 
very like amazingly accepted in the Mambo community. I have to say, we we actually had the honor, I would say, and privilege to teach at uh, Mambo Land, which is run by yeah, yeah, uh, which is you know everybody knows our little boy Nakoya, nice. and so when he invited us to teach there because we built rapport with him we went to italy to train as well for a month at his studio in specific and so when we built the rapport and we were able to teach there i think that really at least for us solidified a lot and made us super proud and accomplished of what you know our journey in mambo because we started with bachata for those that don't know that's what you know we that was a world we entered in and that's the world we're still in but again both of us being colombian we also have our love for salsa it's deeply yeah. ingrained in who we are so we've yeah. never relinquished that i would say that i'm definitely more heavily into bachata gio would say he's more into mambo but we've sort of bridged that our loves for both and we brought that to the table and i think that I'm very proud of our accomplishments in both and we've been accepted in both communities. So I don't think we've ever had any issues in either really. No, I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I think how I see it is that because Wachata is such a new um, genre of, of, of dancing, um, there's much more people in the mambo salsa realm. So there's a lot of artists. Yes. So of course it's, it's a little bit more uh, populated. Um, so of course it's, it's, I'm not saying that bachata is hard to, you know, like to get in there and teach and perform. Yeah. Um, but because so much has been done in salsa mambo, it might take a little bit longer, right? So yeah. To yeah. Well, there. I mean, what, what, what I'm, what I was trying to get at is, you know, I've known you guys dancing salsa for a long time, uh, mm -hmm. before you became the bachata stars, right? I've known you guys doing that, but what I didn't know is because because when I saw Gio dance salsa, both of you, you guys didn't do complicated things, and then all of a sudden, you, you, you guys just popped out with all of this contortionist shit that you do <laughs> in the thing. It's like, so you just came out. Okay, look, we're talking about veterans here. You know, we're talking about a, a filmmaker like Clint Eastwood, and all of a sudden, there goes Gio and Kim making big movies about mambo and salsa. What the fuck? <laughs> Where they come from? See, these people built it slowly like this, and then all of a sudden you pop up hand like this. <laughs> That's what I was saying. <laughs> in a way, and then in a way, it also felt like it took us so long. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it feels, yeah. okay, but at the same time, it feels like it's been a journey, especially because Gio and I we i guess the biggest thing for us and one of our biggest models as dancers has always been to always be students so we never stop learning and mm. for us like we have to continually see growth in ourselves because although we are um satisfied with where we are we're also always attaining or uh trying to attain more in terms of our level of growth and learning That's so noticed about you guys uh you know uh I watch people. I'm a watcher uh, because I'm, an, I'm, I'm a psychologist, so I'm very analytical about personalities, about actions. Uh, uh, I can even create stories. If you guys are just hanging out there, I don't know you guys. Based on the interaction, I'm going to create your life stories. You know, it's called distance analysis. But um, at festivals, I've always observed Geo or even you. You guys observe workshop. You guys observe teachers. Yeah. And I could tell you're like a sponge, you know, absorbing all of these ideas and then incorporating it in your own, which is, which is uh, most teachers should do, that they should never stop becoming student. Uh, they don't have to take a formal class from the class because you're already advanced, you know what I mean? You're already pro. You could get ideas from watching, you know, uh, as we all know in this, in this industry. Uh, For sure. And, and, and I love that you guys do that. Uh, <clears throat> let's go back from the beginning, shall we? Could, first of all, you guys were in a relationship. You guys were lovers. Oh. You guys were boyfriend and girlfriend before. And then you're not. But then what I've seen about you guys uh, being involved in a relationship and then being outside of the relationship in a, in a professional 
manner without the without the uh, uh, without the relationship or love relation we call it. You guys are good friends. You guys are best of friends. How the fuck does that work? <laughs> <laughs> okay, oh this this is a this is a question. Honestly, this shit has been asked to us so many times because yeah. people really want to understand. Yes, does it make sense? Or like, how <laughs> on earth did you guys go from being a couple for so long to uh -huh. just being best friends and really just, best friends? Yeah. Honestly. I think it just boils down to the types of people that we are at our core and what we value most. And I know speaking for myself and Gio can talk about it for me at the end of the day, what was most important to me was Gio was my friend first. We were great friends first before we entered into a romantic relationship. Mm. And so at its core, I always knew that, he was a person that motivated me, that inspired me, and that, you know, That's I fine. felt, oh, no problem. this is a one-time <laughs> thing, that I felt privileged to, to continue to have in my life. So for me, it was important to, even if I was bearing the romantic relationship, it was important for me to retain the friendship. And not even because of the business partnership or because of Arawako, it was really just at his core, Gio is a great person. He's truly a motivator and an inspi like he inspires. And he was a catalyst in my life for, you know, continuing to better myself. Yeah. And that was extremely important. It's just one of those people that come into your life that you know is, is there for a lifetime. So I unfortunately got stuck with this guy regardless, you know, but sometimes I curse the heavens for like, <laughs> for that. But all in all, like, it was just changing, it was perspective. It was perspective and it was um, at its core, just mindset for me. Yeah, for sure. Um, that was some really nice stuff, Kim. You should say that more often. No, thank you. Wow. I'm cry. <laughs> thank you. Um, no, I mean, to what, to what uh, no. Kim said, you know, we, we were definitely really good friends before, yeah. you know, being in a relationship. So we got into a relationship and, you know, so many things happen and we were like, we were young, we were, we're kids, kids yeah. you know, we were kids when mm -hmm. we started a relationship yeah. and then so many things were thrown at us. And yeah. then, you know, unfortunately the relationship didn't work. And, you know, when you, when you break up, obviously there's a little bit of tension and yeah. you don't know how to handle um, situations at that time. Yeah. But we, we had, at the end of the day knew that, you know, despite, you know, not being in a relationship, we still respected uh, each oh, other. Another, yeah. yeah, we respected each other a lot. And and like Kim said, we both inspire each other and we, we help to push each other forward, right? Yeah. So we wanted to continue uh, to develop that, not just on a romantic level, but also like on a business and like being great. Friends. You know, we've been able to develop such a strong friendship. And, you know, yeah. of course it was not easy not uh, when, when we transitioned because imagine we're, we're dancing all the time and then yeah. we, Traveling, it's yeah. done, you know, traveling and then poof, it's done. Because, yeah, you know, wifey and I, Isidra and I were talking about that when you guys saw me the last time, yeah. here, I invited you to, for workshops and, yeah. and, 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 and Gio, you had your significant out there. It's like the dynamics, the, the three of you is like, what the? How does this work? You know, <laughs> I was like, it is like you guys are old friends. Like, what the hell is going on here? Like, but everybody's so perplexed. Oh yeah, we were in Sweden. <laughs> was it last year? Last year yeah. for um... we were in Sweden for an event with Junior Aquino and Carolina. It was Mama Rumba. He does this event with two other people. <laughs> yeah, and we were in an after party, and we were in the hotel room. And we were sitting there and literally were undergoing an interrogation. Seriously. A serious interrogation. We had, um, it was Sueco, Sueco Junior. Joan Honestly, it was Sueco Joanna, um, Junior, Junior Carolina. Carolina. Um, who's that couple from? Oh my God, the Polish Katarina? couple. We're friends with the Polish couple. What are their names again? Oh, Gosia, Gosia. Gosia, yeah. 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 Um, uh, oh my God, who else? Alex and Maria. And so we were just in this room and they were like, okay, it was serious like, question. They were like, just like rapid like, fire. They're like, 
how? I was like, can I get some yeah. water, please? <laughs> They're like, how? You can't tell us that nothing is going on. How did you guys do it? And we're like, nothing is going on. Like nothing has, from the moment that we like ended the relationship, nothing has, we've just been best friends. And for us, that was super important to maintain like the professionalism and to maintain our friendship, mm -hmm. as well as the way that I explain it, it makes no sense. And no matter how we slice it, for most people, it won't make sense because it's yeah. not it's not common to maintain such a close relationship with a significant other, especially after the years that we had. Yeah. But, um, but then that's the thing about it that I like. I love watching that because, you know, you, you know, me and my wife had been married for many years and we've been together for a total of 15 years or so. We never fought any single one. And if you ask me to explain why I cannot, just like you, I just cannot fucking explain it. That maybe it was meant to be for both of us. I mean, I'm 20 years older than her for crying out loud, you know. But um, that's a great example, though. I love that example because in our industry, as you know, too many breakups, too many get involved. And I've always advised against it, meaning uh, <clears throat> if your partner, you don't want to be in a relationship with your partner because uh, down the line, you guys are going to break up. And you know what? I'm 99.999% true, you know, but uh, uh, it, it, I'd rather have it. You guys work professionally as friends, then you guys will never break up, you know, but then there is this, then there is uh, uh, Gio and Kim who are our best of friends now. And, and it's great to, to see that in our industry because then there's hope. <laughs> yes it's yeah true. no no thank you honestly it's, it's definitely a rarity yeah um but uh, there is hope for sure it's not easy but if you're willing to you know yeah put your egos aside and and you know look at what's most picture, important and look yeah. at the bigger picture there's definitely a way for sure yeah so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask each one of you i'm gonna ask kim first what's on your mind when you need to be creative kim what do you, what are you what are your thought process my thought process when it comes to creativity um and creativity in terms of what aspect dancing teaching what up um so when it comes to teaching when it comes to dancing choreography my thought process is seeking inspiration mm. um, i like to seek inspiration from different outlets so for me um, areas where I'm able or places where I'm able to open up my mind the most are where I like to go. That to me is tapping into nature. Nature is one of my biggest sources of creativity. So when I need to come up with a workshop or when I need to come up with a choreography, for example, or when I need to tap into my creative side, I love to go for a walk, a walk and just exist and observe and connect back to nature and connect back to the world. And I find that being able to be in that space where I open up my mind allows me when I go back into the studio and put on music to just flow more freely. There's something about the flow of nature that directly ties into the flow of movement. And so for me, that's always been my like space. And I always revert back to that. It's just, okay, let me go for a walk. Let me open up my mind. Sometimes I listen to some music and then when I go back, I find that I tap into like my deepest source of inspiration. What about you, uh, uh, Gio? Are you like one of those people that are just good in math and they were just born with it? Oh, he is just good at math and he was just <laughs> born with it. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> All right, I'm done with this interview, God damn. <laughs> Gio's a sponge for anybody that doesn't know. Gio is a sponge. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't but born with a man. It's, it's, you know, like I was just people, I, I practiced it. Lots of <laughs> math and lots of math. Math. <laughs> but, uh, In terms of creativity, there's so many different things. So many things yeah. I mean, I love, I love being able to just bring myself back to like present, kind of like what Kim said, but I'll, I'll, I'll give my take as well, too. I do believe that, you know, sometimes it's hard to really tap into that creative space, that flow. Yeah. Um, but what, what I found for me, at least uh, where I'd find my most creative is when I lock myself up, you oh. know, and like, sometimes this is going to sound really funny, sure. <laughs> but I'll, I'll turn all the lights off mm -hmm. and I just music on and I'm just, I'm just jamming 
just listening to music to see if anything comes. And then I try to get inspired that way. I also get inspired by so many amazing dancers that are out there, yeah. not just in salsa. I also look in different genres. Yeah. I see like ballet, contemporary, hip hop, because like that's like the whole realm of the world. Um, nature again, there, there are, there, I love uh, shapes yeah. and like figures and sequences. So I'm into that a lot. That really helps inspire me in terms of my creative process. But he does lock process. himself up for real. But I do lock <laughs> myself up. And then sometimes I'll literally dark spot and I'll blast uh, a light on my face. Or for example, and this will sound really, really crazy. But when I would just dance, I would put either people cheering me on, like a YouTube thing where people are cheering me on while music is happening or people booing me. And I'm just in a zone. I don't know. It, it, it takes me into like a different trance where i'm like completely in that moment and i just kind of allow things to to vibe well you get into some type of transformation because i i was watching you once at toronto what is it no montreal salsa congress or something and i was there i was a guest there i believe and uh i was watching your social dance with someone and you're just so cool about it, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden you went into that transformation where like all of a sudden everything is achy breaky and shit. And it's like, what the <laughs> fuck is happening? <laughs> you're not bored or something. I don't know. But so to all of your promoters out there, if you want Gio to be more creative in his workshop, put him in jail for three <laughs> days or something. Solitary confinement, everyone. Solitary yeah. Not enough. You need to be alone in a dark room. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> don't feed him, God damn it. <laughs> the reason, there's a reason why if you see like oh, where God. I do all my videos, it's all black. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I know. I've seen it on Instagram or something. Because you know? I've been active on Instagram uh, 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 for a minute there and I've seen you. It's like, okay, he's in his, he's in his cave. You yeah, know? Uh, it's the lab, man. Yeah, yeah, it's called the lab or whatever. But uh, now, when it comes to dancing, how did you both start? Like, start with you, Kim. How did you start dancing? Meaning, uh, Latin dances, salsa, uh, bachata. So I always, I always credit my love for dance and especially for music to my parents. My parents were um, the biggest sources of inspiration. Um, They taught me the most about music, about its history, about our culture, because my parents were dancers. So not dancers in the studio sense, but they were dancers. They frequented Latin clubs. They were known in the city. Um, They would have their VIP area the moment that they walked into a club. And my parents met dancing. They met at one of the longest running Latin clubs here in Toronto, which is called El Rancho. It's been around for, I think, almost 40 years. And that's where they met. They met dancing. My dad was in a merengue competition with this shiny shirt (laughs) and his jerry curls because it was in the 80s. And my mom saw him and was like, that is my future man and it was and it ended up being my parents have been together now for i think almost 35 years and dance and music was an integral part of my life i was just a shy kid i hated when my parents put me on the spot to dance yeah i hated it i didn't like to do it i prefer to just dance in like in solitude in my room but I would listen to music. I would learn lyrics to songs. I would listen to all the CDs that my dad had, and then I would just dance. And that's sort of how it started. And then it wasn't until university where like our paths converged because it was university that we were both part of a Latin organization called Olas. It was a student-run organization. And again, you bring you get a bunch of Latinos together. What are they going to do? They're going to put music and they're going to dance. So dance was a huge part of the organization. And that was our introduction to the like Latin dance world, like the studio world. We had a best friend that was also part of our team later on, Lee Lloyd Williams. <laughs> and um, he had a cousin that traveled the world, went to congresses. So he kind of knew about the world. And then he told us, he's like, do you know that there's people around <laughs> the world that go to events and dance? And that they dance for a living and we're like... I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. (laughs) We're like, nah, whatever. And then he would show us videos 
And then we would search YouTube at that time because that was the source for videos. And that's where we came across Frankie Martinez. And we came across, across like Georgette and Troy. And we came across all those videos and we're like, okay, why not? Let's explore it. But that's sort of how we entered that world. But dance from like inception, like I pretty much have lived, breathed, music and dance, bachata, salsa, merengue, cumbia, vallenato, like we're talking about everything, like it's, it's coursing through my, my veins and it's been a part of me and an integral part ever since. So. Yeah. And for me, um, not the same, but similar. Um, <laughs> growing up, similar. it was very similar. You know, Latin families just love music. Yeah. <laughs> Most of them. I know some of them don't. There's the odd ones that don't, but uh, the majority. Yeah, but the majority love music. So, you know, growing up, music well, we love was the parties. All, yeah, so. <laughs> like all weekends, there's always you're always going to somebody's house, and people are partying. The kids are by themselves in one corner, and the parents are on the other side. You know, and uh, music is always playing. Saturday mornings, you know, you're being woken up real early to, to clean, to clean to music. and and you're cleaning with music, and you and you got to do it with you got to do it with rhythm, or else your mom's gonna slap you in your head. What are you doing? That's not how you clean. That's not how There's you clean. There's a rhythm. <laughs> there has to be a rhythm to it. <laughs> the broom was our first dance partner. <laughs> yeah, that was my very first dance partner. Me and the broom. Oh my goodness. Go way back. Yeah. I, I, I kind of I relate with that because my, uh, uh, my mom uh, and then my dad always danced to mambo and cha-cha-cha. You know, okay. like w when you were talking about mambo or something, we're talking about Paris Prado. Yeah. I mean way back there dude and i remember those songs and i remember my parents always dancing together if it weren't for them i i don't think i would have ever been attracted to latin music or even latin dancing for that matter um it's just not until you know when i got older that for some reason it called me there uh because of that route that i have and and to this day i'm not uh I don't mean to be stereotyping per se, but when I see Latinos that can't dance, it's like, what the fuck happened here? What's wrong with you guys? You know, when I, the same thing with Filipinos, they can't sing. What the hell, man? What's going on? <laughs> you know? But I think it has something to do with, with your parents and, and, and your family, right? It does. It does because when, when Gio continues his story, like he'll give the reason why I think many Latinos still to this day don't pursue dancing yeah i mean uh because you gave that reason yeah you know it's it's a pretty it's a pretty simple reason it, it makes sense for your story yeah continue. okay wow wow it's rushing me wow. and stuff. excuse me <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad you guys are best of friends <laughs> don't rush me <laughs> oh my bad i didn't know i thought you forgot me, I no 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 so i was thank you thank you for looking out so you know i continued to grow up with dancing, my mom loved dancing. She's yeah, Colombian lady. Uh, she lived yeah. in Colombia for ten years. She moved to Jamaica for five. She had family there, then moved to Canada. So there was also that reggae influence as well too. Mm. I had the Caribbean, but also Colombian. She also had the Caribbean and Colombian, but Jamaica, and then Canada. So I always listened to music. My mom would force me to dance in in parties. I hated it. Just don't. Uh, I was yeah, the right. only child. No, no, no. At the beginning, I hated oh, okay. to dance. My mom would force me to dance at the beginning, and I did not like it. She's like, you dance like a white boy. There is no son of mine that is not going to learn how to dance. You're going to learn. No so, offense to white people, because we know that you guys can learn No, how to there dance. is amazing. Okay. There are some, some amazing dancers. But so that's just that the was stereotype. Just, that was a stereotype, right? All is of it? our white friends, I'm sorry. sorry. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> no. We apologize. <laughs> but yeah, so continuing on, uh, so I, I grew up dancing and I, I started to gain a love. For, I actually love more like hip hop and reggae dance hall and all that stuff. Um, but then later on, as Kim said, university came around, uh, became part of this organization. Got us in touch with our roots. <laughs> yeah, got more in touch with our roots, you know, and uh, we got exposed. To yeah, we got world. exposed. And the biggest reason that I think that a lot of Latinos may not necessarily that first of all just in general don't know how to dance some of them um is you know culturally sometimes there's a lot of latin people that don't really dance or their parents don't know how to dance yeah number one right or and music then, isn't a big part yeah of, it's not like a, their life yeah because yeah, there's a lot of countries that salsa and machata might not be a part of their their culture <laughs> so to speak right and yeah. then the second thing why people 
I think that Latin people don't like to learn how to dance um, in in, um, class. in classes or ballrooms, so to speak, or studio. Oh, that's what they yeah. It. Is that oh, uh, I already know how to dance. Like, what is a non-Spanish person gonna, gonna teach, teach me, me how, how to dance? dance. Salsa. Yeah. I already know how to dance. I don't need to learn. If I'm already I, good yeah. enough. So yeah. it's it's uh. It's, I just feel the music. Yeah. I feel the music. You don't need to teach me. What are you teaching me counts for? What's counts? There's no counts. You What's just timing? You feel it. <laughs> Well, that's exactly how the Dominicans feel for crying out loud. That's why they're not counting and they're not taking classes because or, what the hell are you guys teaching my dance? <laughs> or it's the argument that, you know, a Latino gives that, oh yeah, okay, I'll take a few classes to learn a few new moves, yeah. you know, but, you know, and they think about it in terms of just adding moves to what they already know, but not actually, you know, relearning understanding. what understanding okay what okay with, with that with that with that thought in mind though because y you just touch on something that's very interesting subject to me because both of you has went to dance school i came from dance school also but but both of you also started from uh just dancing in your backyard and whatnot because of your family <clears throat> the 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 issue here is the, the rules that once you become a student in a school, there are rules of dancing, there are etiquette, there are certain things that needs to be followed, right? Yeah. As opposed to street dancing, there are no rules. There is no timing. Uh, uh, there is no on beat. There is no proper etiquette in holding the partner. There's none of that. But how do you, how do you feel about this when uh, uh, teaching a class, there's an argument in, in social media in the past. I think it still does to this day about these uh, principles, the principles in the street and the principles in the school. How do you both feel about it? Do you, do you both embrace it or do you embrace a certain particular side? You know? I think that, um this is this has been something i've really been like thinking about in and i oh, think yeah. we're similar in that like i know you're a psychologist so you're really you deep but yeah. like i i think sometimes i think like like a, a psychologist and i like try to sex, dissect yeah. and really try to understand things right yeah and so you know i really was trying to figure out i'm like is it that it has to be structured or like flavor and feeling yeah. or like technique and and like lines and it has to be this way is it one or the other is mm -hmm. it black and white yeah <laughs> and you know there has been times throughout like our careers as we learn oh, yeah. where we've had certain specific ideologies of things so at the beginning ideology feeling flavor what do i need to look like a like a oh, you know a robot soul street yeah. and look like a robot and not all of them dance like that but what i was seeing at the perception certain, at, yeah the perception was yeah, you're gonna look so stiff and that's not to me it wasn't latin dance my perception at that time right then i got into dancing and then i realized okay there's a little bit more to it and then there's technique and then at one point i'm like oh but why don't they learn and then i'm like maybe they should learn and then my mind started to close up in a little bit to, to <laughs> the, the, the technical, student, the side, technical yeah. side and the technique and, and and how to how to do everything but i think as the years have have uh have passed by and I've continued to study and, and just look at things, I feel like you got to embrace it all because you have to understand that at the end of the day, what, what, is, what is dance for? It's, what is it? It's, it's music, it's celebration. It's a celebration of life. It's ex expression, it's right? It's enjoyment, it's, it's freedom, en yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's whatever you want it to be, you know? So um, to say that w one or the other is nonsensical. You know? Yeah, the reason I ask you that is because I, I'm sure you guys have experience with judging, and I have so much experience with judging from from uh, uh, word Latin dance to just local or whatever. Is <clears throat> then you can't help it, right? You can't help it, but look, and then you can't help but analyze. One time I was judging, and, and the head judge was here, judging here at a very big competition, world competition, and it was mumbo. Okay, it was mumbo, particularly mumbo on two, of course, and. I love the way they dance. You have this category here. You got timing, you got uh, execution of techniques, blah, blah, blah. I ignored all of that. I went to full mode. What is your overall thing? It's like, perfect mambo, man. 
perfect fucking mambo. <laughs> and so after all of the tallies and everything, we gathered, the head just gathered. It's like, why the fuck is that couple first place? <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? That's like, he asked, he asked every judge, so like, why? It's like, well, the technique is flawless, blah, blah, blah. blah and, that. and then I'm like, I like the overall content. I like the dancers. I like the way they present it. It's like, do you dis would you discuss techniques? I don't need to. They, they, they scored it. And then he, and he comes to him like, no, there was nothing, complication and everything. And so th that, the hit butt was just right there. But sometimes, just like what you're saying, you got to, you got to consider everything. It, not everything is technique. Not everything is, you know. I mean, look at Rodolfo for crying out loud in the Dominican Republic. We all know he came from dance school. Yes. His posture, his execution of techniques, his timing, his attitude, you know for a fact he came from school, but yet embracing his traditional culture at the same time. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's why like one of our models um, in the later years of Arawaku became you know, where feeling meets technique. And we promote like that heavily, where feeling meets meets technique because for us it's that marriage of the flavor of the essence of the flow of that that you know that heart with like the mind with the technical yeah. with learning technique and and um fine-tuning your dancing because it's important to have both and i think that some of the most amazing dancers are the dancers that understand both in my opinion or the dancers that i'm inspired by are the dancers that i can see combine both you yeah. know they have the standing of letting loose of freedom of expression of you know just embodying movement and embodying the music and they also have invested their time to learn the history the roots the culture and the technical aspect what it is that they're dancing and yeah. i think that's what makes a very complete dancer is a dancer that understands both which, which bring me to this question uh uh, since I met you guys and all of that, and I know how you guys started, where you guys started, when you guys started. Why embrace Dominican? There are many other styles there. Why particularly, number one, bachata, and particularly this traditional aspect of it? What made you both decide this? And how was the, deci how was the process of that deciding factor? That's a great you go first, uh, uh, Gio. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> you have I, to talk about our grassroots. I, I, I hope I hope that Kim's dad doesn't watch this. <laughs> he doesn't know this story. Yeah, either. so so what happened was um the reason why like I started I I was listening more to salsa before, right? And I listened to Achata, but it didn't like it wasn't like it was a main thing, it was just like as passing by I would listen to Achata. So you know, I was listening to my extreme I was into Aventura, you know, all the, you know. So I tried to hit the mainstream. Yeah, mainstream, market. mainstream. And then Kim came around and then, you know, she was like, hey, uh, I, this is good music, but let me, let me, uh, let me show you some Antonio Santos. Some and Luis Vargas. Some Luis Vargas. Raulín, yeah. So I don't remember the first song she, she made me do was an Antonio Santos song. And I am sorry to all <laughs> people. And I'm like. He's learned I'm like, over the years. <laughs> it's all right but you know like i like i like my extreme you know like what did i say you know, I know like, <laughs> she like, looked at don't me don't ever like tell my dad that <laughs> yeah so i wasn't for me at the beginning i wasn't sold yeah. on it right but then as it progressed you know and, and kim started to you know expose me to more uh, music from all these amazing artists and there were certain videos as well that that we saw and one video that really attracted me um, was from the Dominican barbershop that Troy and Georgette, the, oh, the three, the three parts. Man. And there was one dancer in specific that like was like the highlight for him. It was was fire. that the was that the bodybuilder guy? Fragancia. No, 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 not no, no, no. The bodybuilder but he was amazing guy. too. The bodybuilder, too, <laughs> Fragancia, the Fra guy that. Oh they, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, he is awesome. Yes. Oh man. And Jill was just like, okay. That's why that has sway, <laughs> that has flow. Like I'm a little bit more interested. Mm -hmm. Wait, 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 Gio. You didn't know that you can do a lot with the music of traditional. I mean, you could do a lot more than extreme with that with 
time, you know, because I didn't, didn't, I didn't, I didn't rub around a lot of Dominicans in, yeah. in uh, Toronto. Um, I wasn't, I know there was Dominicans, but I wasn't with the Dominicans. I was with more of the, the Central Americans. I was with the <laughs> El Salvadorians, yeah. the yeah. and the Nicaraguenses, you know, and, and they don't, they don't do bachata, you know, like I mean, there is a few of them, you like know, they but, do, yeah. but they don't do it like Dominicans do it, right? So I was listening to all the mainstream stuff. And it was actually, it was interesting because it was someone in, it was a friend in the organization that had extensively studied the Dominican barbershop videos and was implementing that into his style of dance. And he was a bartender at a Latin club. So he was exposed also to a lot of Dominicans that would go out. And so his style of dancing was very like, you know, like a, it was more like an Islander, like the way that he danced. And so there was one time where we were dancing outside of the, outside of our student club. And he asked me to dance. And he, he started with that flow. And I wasn't accustomed to encountering someone that danced that way outside of my family. I was used to dancing with my family that way. And then I was used to the one, two, three, tap. One, two, three, tap. When I would go to a club or when I would be, you know, just out and about. And so when I started dancing with him and we sort of meshed in our flow and we were dancing on two. I remember we were dancing on two and then Gio saw that and he was like, wait, 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 hold up. That I've never seen in my life. You've never danced that way. Yeah, ever like, Yo, with why have me. you never danced like that with me? Like, <laughs> I have, I have, you like extreme. That's why I'm, I'm like, wow. Is it because I put my, I got braids? And is that I was like, it's because you like extreme. That's why. And he's like, no. And then he like is a very competitive person. He's an athlete, right? So yeah. he had that mindset. So for him, it was just like, no, no one's, no one is going to show me up with my girl. Okay. Because <laughs> at the time. And so he started setting those videos. He got more into it. And then that's how he started to, you know, go into that world. Mm -hmm. You have to admit that. <clears throat> the structure of that particular dance we're talking about, and particularly the traditional style of, of bachata, it's very hard to learn even if you're advanced. If you came from salsa, if you came from uh, uh, other dances, ballroom, let's say, or if you even came from the side-to-side -side traveling, side-to-side -side type of bachata, yeah. okay. you are not going to get the traditional aspects and the flow of it until you really get into it, not, not to mention get into the music, because it's hard to to feel that on extreme you know <laughs> it's true no, 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 it it's is. true 100 percent. and something that i don't think i've i've mentioned you know but yeah i haven't mentioned to anybody well very few people is that at first when when kim played that music for me i wasn't a hundred percent a fan but then later on i started to love it and it just exploded my love for bachata and what i realized afterwards was that well i knew my grandmother um rest in peace she was a very well-known singer back in guatemala and she used to sing boleros oh and so i was like there's something about this music that just and then afterwards my my love for it just grew so much more afterwards yeah, it's, it's pretty much the same structure of bolero it's very similar and, and whatnot oh, but... that were recorded at, back at that time were like covers of boleros like they took yeah boleros and they they turned it into bachata so but, it's like but interesting because Gio pretty much is a crazy man when it comes to dancing right <laughs> <laughs> he has his he has his moods when he get into that mood we're talking requinto and mambo side of back in bachata oh you can do so much you know it's like natural right <laughs> yeah 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 man. I love it I love it so much I've, you know, I've when it comes to salsa both of you you know, you came from, uh, you have Colombian background, as obviously, and then you have street background, even in salsa per se, where you don't have to do, uh, 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 what do you call that mambo side? It's, it's very uh, linear. You, have to, you don't have to do linear uh, stuff as, as opposed to circular or any space, whatnot. What do you feel when you dance mambo? Do you feel, the, do you ha do you feel that you have to follow the circuit? For example, for me, I would dance timba. I would dance to timba. Okay, I would dance to Cuban salsa, and most of them dance is on three. I dance on two with it, circular, you know. And people find that weird, right? But what how, what do you feel about this? Uh, honestly, like if I'm talking about now, like I I dance it how I feel it. Like yeah. you know, 
of course I learned structure and I understand yeah. like what what they how they danced it you know in the era you know mambo and mm. you know mm. 40s, 60s you know in, in New York and, yeah. and the Palladium um, but everything I believe evolves and there's an evolution and, and there's a mixture of of genres and, and different movements and understandings of different things so of course like there are a lot of nuances that I use definitely when we're talking about mambo um, but I'm not going to keep it super linear I'm, I'm going to have my side to side from the song then I'm going to add some a bit of afro a little bit yeah. of the Cuban influence as well too I mean mambo is Cuban so yeah. <laughs> it's Cuban right <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, but uh yeah no I, I mix different things up you know, but there, of course, there are different things within the structure of the music that if I feel it that way, I'm going to do it, you know, because, yeah. you know, why am I, of course, learn the box, but then break, break the, box, the box, yeah. understand it, and then be creative with it, you know, why do you have to do it exactly the same way as everybody else? Kim, you being partly Dominican, how proud of you, Bachata, as a Dominican, how proud are your parents now or your relatives knowing now that fucking Bachata, who used to be looked down to, is freaking popular? Honestly, like, my dad is probably one of the most silently proud, like, <laughs> supporters ever. Like, my parents, both my parents, but especially my dad, because my dad is a man of few words. He, he speaks when it's important for him to speak, but um, he's extremely proud to see what I've managed to accomplish, especially given that I came from a university degree, working for the government, leaving my job, my comfortable, secure job at the government, <laughs> not pursuing what I, you know, went to school for, for a full-time career in dance. And at the beginning, my parents were like, oh, fuck no. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, you know what I mean? What are you doing? Like, this is not the right move. Like my parents were scared, of course. And it wasn't until they started to see one, how much I loved it, how much it brought life to me when they started to see that I was traveling, that I was getting paid for it, that I was, you know, making something of my life because of dance, that they really started to gain an understanding and appreciation for what I did. And I think that exposed them to what Wachata became, especially for my dad. It exposed my family. I have so many relatives that I don't even talk to, but that love my videos, each and every single video that I post on yeah. Instagram and Facebook. And it's because they're so proud to see me representing my culture, representing my roots on a global scale. And it's made me proud to be able to do that as well. But I don't think... I don't think anybody really expected Machata to get to the level <laughs> that it got to, or at the very least, not when we started. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I, I, you know, most most Dominicans uh, that I talked to feel felt that way and feel that way that like, how do you guys make this popular? <laughs> it's like you guys know Machata. I mean, you know, when when uh, I was uh, starting a festival in Santo Domingo, right, with uh, Bessa. Even the hotel staff is like, why don't you guys just do salsa festival instead of bachata? <laughs> you know? A lot of, I think it's changed now again because on the island, because bachata has reached a globalization. But for a long time, you would go to the Dominican Republic and you wouldn't hear bachata. You would hear salsa. They were heavy salseros. Merengue, yeah. Um, Regaton, yeah. Ron Dembo. You yeah. would hear the street more urban, even like Colombian. Col Colombia has a huge influence in the Dominican Republic, especially when it comes to salsa. A lot of the salsa. Uh, 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 Valinato. Valinato, cumbia. Yeah. Mm. So a lot of bachatas are also vallenatos, like mm. vallenato covers. So it's interesting now to see what bachata has become even mm. in the Dominican Republic, you know, and the importance of bachata even in the Dominican Republic. I think I, I, I like the way it becomes, and I, I, I like the fact that the elites in the Dominican Republic are starting to appreciate, uh, appreciate it because it does make the country look good, not just the merengue part. Uh, in fact, compared to merengue now, you know, bachata is much, much more po popular, much more likable than merengue, I'm sorry to say, not saying that, uh, that when you become a bachatero or a bachata dancer, 
it's almost automatic that you are dancing. You're going to have to dance merengue also. That's just the way it is, you know. Uh, let's talk about that. How do you feel about merengue, both of you? Oh, I love merengue. I love merengue. Merengue is I, like, <laughs> I think merengue. Wait, 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 wait. Knowing you guys crazy, being crazy in dancing, it's so simple dance. How do you make it crazy? I mean, I'm just, cra I don't know how I make it crazy. I just make everything crazy. <laughs> Honestly, like we had a, one of our old shows had a merengue section that we choreographed. Mm -hmm. And we were choreographing that section for us, it was just about creativity. You know what I mean? Because merengue is high energy. So for us, especially when it comes to a show, it's important to, to infuse creativity in that, you know, because a show is different than when you're just dancing, you know, socially. Um, but I love merengue. Merengue has always been, you know, again, I'm half Dominican. Merengue with bachata, it was it goes hand in hand, you know what I mean? Salsa, merengue, bachata. Yeah. And, you know, there's something that merengue music does, you know, to, it's almost like what Caribbeans feel about soca. You know what I mean? It's our happy music. It's our carnival music. It's the music that makes us come alive. Right. And so that's something that if I hear it, I'm going crazy. Like <laughs> If I hear that one merengue song, I am going all out on the dance floor dancing to that song. But I know that there isn't the same appreciation for merengue that there was even in the 80s and the 90s like i talked to my parents oh. i talked to my parents again they were veterans in the scene before i was and so when i spoke to them in the 80s and the 90s in toronto specifically um the latin scene was run by three pockets of people it was run by ecuadorians ecuadorians who love merengue love salsa love bachata they sort of like they they love that they love latin music ecuadorians colombians and dominicans dominicans were a huge community um at that time and they sort of dispersed after but during the 80s and the 90s it was merengue that was at its height you would hear salsa and you were here merengue in the club and then bachata came into the picture and started to like push merengue out yes of the box like yeah. no goodbye but merengue had its high and it had its time where it was merengue competitions. You would hear that, like, you know what I mean? Everybody had an appreciation. Dominican Republic was equated to merengue, right? And I'm, now- I mean, I'm still amazed that when Oro Solido have concert, it's fucking packed, you know? Oh, yeah. yeah, because- <laughs> And I think merengue made its way around Latin America. Oh yeah, for sure. Honestly, for me growing up, I mainly listened to salsa, merengue, merengue Cumbias. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Oh, by the way, okay, let me ask you about cumbia. Because there are two styles, right? We got the Colombian, we got the Me 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 Mexico. I mean, we, I mean, I happen to really like Colombian because, of course, it relates to the traditional aspects of it, like bachata. It's concrete. It's compact as opposed to the, the Mexican way of dancing where they, they even do acrobatics and stuff, you know? Um, honestly, like... I don't know. You're you're half central. Too, I'm so. I'm half central, so Guatemala's right beside Mexico. Uh, so I mean, I never did any of that acrobatic stuff, but like you know, I, I love I love cumbias from all over the place. Of course, I love Colombia, the roots of that. But I also like I appreciate cumbias from everywhere. I was listening to all this type of music. Yeah. Um, I don't have like one or the other that I prefer more. You know, I mean, maybe the Colombian cumbias. There's something oh, different definitely. to it that I that I enjoy a lot for, for, me, sure. for sure. Um, but I, I appreciate it all for sure because I was just listening to everything, every type of music in Colombia. Colombia for sure, was, but Colombian for me. I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't raised around Central Americans, so I wasn't exposed to. I didn't even know there was Mexican style cumbia until like I started befriending Mexicans and more Central Americans. Yeah. For me. Cumbia was what came out of Colombia and I didn't know anything else. It was what I, you know, heard at family parties and what my uncles and aunts would like get drunk on, you know, and karaoke to <laughs> like at one o'clock in the morning. But um, I, I think I've done my little cumbia routines when I was in high school and stuff. And I think Gio did too. Like, yeah, for sure. We have like our quinces where like, you know, we had to do like dances and most often were cumbia in our little like, you know, traditional. Yeah. 
You know, um, uh, given that you started, both of you started in this profession, dancing and teaching and performing, starting a dance team and all of that. It is now 2021. A lot of things happen in our industry. Uh, the politics of it, the, the dark side of it, the triumph and the victories of it. Uh, starting with Geo, what did you learn that you didn't expect in our industry? From our industry during COVID? Um, that people could learn online. <laughs> <laughs> that people could I still don't believe it, but go ahead. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, for me, honestly, I, I'll, I'll give you just my, my personal experience. You know, I knew that you could, I knew you could learn online. Um, we but had been learning like, online. We had been le learning online. I'm, again, I can pick up things. I'm a, a, a visual person, so I can see things. And, and I, I train with people online years before this whole pandemic, yeah. right? Um, but where people didn't want to do things online or do things of that sort, it kind of forced everybody to make a decision, right? And um, it, it has helped people, um, number one, learn how to learn online learn a new way of learning <laughs> yeah learn a new way of learning and yeah. in terms of the the industry i think um from what i'm seeing and and talking to a lot of uh dance and and business professionals um that people are are connecting a lot more um due to to the whole pandemic because there there has there has been a lot of division during our time and before yeah. you know that we've heard from a lot of people. Um, but I think because of everything that has happened, uh, of course, there are some people that are, are still bitter about everything that's happened. Of course, mm -hmm. it's, it's a very uh, unfortunate and, and catastrophic thing. Um, but a lot of people have really opened themselves up and have been a lot more open to, to communicating with, uh, working with people and doing collaborations um, to see how everybody can grow together and how they can create um, different things. Yeah, because I think like uh, tying into it was very similar. Like my response tying into what Gio said, COVID was sort of like it hit the reset. You know, it put everybody on the same level, same playing field. You mm -hmm. know, it forced everybody to start from the same, you know, the same line, like the yeah. same line. And so it was a period of self reflection for everybody, where all all of those, like, you know, all of the things that were sort of dividing us before no longer mattered because what were we divided for to begin with? Now we're all separated. Now we're all locked up in our homes. Now none of us are in the studio or, or dancing or teaching or performing or traveling except every single weekend. Except you know? areas in the States. Except now. for certain areas in the States, of course. <laughs> I mean, I'm a little sour about that, but that's okay. Yeah. We're not going to say all those things in Los Angeles, but we're not going to say all those things. Go ahead. <laughs> but, we're not going to say. <laughs> but yeah, so, but when the pandemic started, you know, we were all in under quarantine, right? And so I think it forced a lot of us to reflect that, you know, everything in life is fleeting, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. nothing in life is guaranteed. And I think that was the lesson that we all learned, you know, what's the point of, of what? like these arguments and, and having these, you know, these fights and division between one another, like, what does that actually mean? Yeah. What does it serve us? You know what I mean? Especially for the dance industry that was so hardly hit by the pandemic because it's in-person interaction that makes our world go round, right? I mean, and, I think they did it specifically for us. I mean, well, they can't be close to each other. Right? They can't touch each other. Yeah, we're going to create a pandemic for them. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? Exactly. So yeah. it was sort of like, okay, well, now, like, we have to figure out a way to collectively support one another to keep dance alive. And I think that became the focus in our dance industry in the community was how do we keep people interested in an industry that can easily fall to the background because it's no longer in people's yeah. face, faces. You know? And the last thing, one, one more thing that I wanna add is 
that we realized how important uh, dance connection and is. dance culture and dance connection is, where maybe we, we uh, took it for granted before. Yeah, I think we did. I think we took it for granted. Uh, I think we become nitpickers. Uh, we became nitpickers then. I was like, oh, what the fuck? He is not pushing on the fourth beat. No, that's just not good. Oh, what the hell? There's no flow here. You know. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. Yeah. It's, I mean, everyone. It's so true. Here's my, here's my analogy. An art, a painting, is created by an artist, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. An art can never be changed again once it's there. But the artist is always evolving, yes. is always changing to be a better artist than he used to be. Mm -hmm. We are artists. Yes. Mm -hmm. We create arts, okay? Whether it's bachata, whether it's salsa or mambo, because that's just being a human being. We have the ability to to do our own thing. Hey, you know, hey, you know, uh, that's that's Geo style right there. He's dancing the Geo style influenced by Kim with the bachata light there and everything. You all know my students. You know for a fact they're my student because they dance like me. <laughs> you know, I don't say it that way. You better dance strictly like me. No, I'm not. it's just is, you know, but but that's that's it right there. The artist is so different from the art, is that the art cannot be changed but the artist is always changing so every time he creates an art it's different you know and at the end of the day like dance is art right and and what is art you know like it's subjective yeah you know when you say no that's not how you dance that's not how you dance yeah that's not it that you know it, it's just come on like that's now like old <laughs> yeah i i hope that is old because in our bachata industry if it's not divided yeah, we're talking about every style. If it's not divided and that we all support each other, okay, I think it's it will be the strongest. And not too many people realize that because the reason we don't realize it because in our community, whether it's salsa, bachata, and everything, it it's a crab mentality, okay. You know, when the crab is almost there into the top, the other crabs bring them down. No matter what, it's just their nature. So I hope that changes. I hope we are the change. We could change it, you know, and, and I'm hopeful that that happens. Um, I used to burn bridges in the past. What for? You know, it, it, it doesn't benefit me. It doesn't benefit the other person. Uh, you only lose to yourself. And so that's that's been forgotten as of now. I'm glad I'm doing this podcast because I'm doing everyone. Come on here, you know. Let's talk about shit, you know. <laughs> like you were saying, it's it's about like the change coming from each individual person yeah, from within yeah. and collective. Yeah. You know, this is amazing because it's a platform where we get to discuss these type of things, yeah. and they see, oh, Rodney's doing this, and now Kim and G are saying we do this. Oh, maybe we'll do this. Yeah. And if it's one person, then another yeah. person that eventually, you know, it spreads. Effect, yeah. you know, I'll give you an example here. We all know that Daniel and Desiree does sensual stuff, right? The moment they were, there was one video that I saw them and I shared it myself. Uh, they're dancing to Kiko Rodriguez and Romeo Santos song. Uh, um, I forgot, that's my favorite song of that album, by the way. And they were dancing, mixing everything right there. Are you fucking kidding me? That was beautiful. I was like, whoa, that's, that's just so great. Instead of me, instead of me saying, yeah, well, you know, the body rolling, it's, it doesn't really fit in. <laughs> I didn't say it that way. <laughs> because the thing is, you can appreciate, like, we should still be able to appreciate art for art. Art, you know, art. And again, like, I think for a long time, it was forgotten that dance is art. And that creativity in art should be accepted. It should be appreciated. It should be acknowledged you know what well, I mean? as a let's just say let's just say this and it's a fact creativity has no rules there are no rules in creativity and creativity is is taking from different things absolutely yes. absolutely and so, making them better thing is is like exactly like, just that one thing no. it's it's a combination of things from its nature from nature yeah yeah um, 
right? So, so what's the what's the vision when everything else is cool? Let's say 2022 festivals, <laughs> uh, blah blah blah. What's the vision, guys? Go ahead, you go first. Go, no, go, go. I mean, you know, like like Kim said that we're we're shifting a little bit, but uh, definitely, you know, it's going to be in a different way that that we're still going to be here supporting especially where we are in our community here in Toronto and in Canada and eventually, you know, getting out to travel a Again, bit more, you know, that's possible. <laughs> um, Kim's going to be doing a lot more traveling than I will. Yes. Um, just because of, you know, life. situations in life. I'm, uh, I'm getting married in less than three months. I know. <laughs> so, you know, comes with congrats. congrats. Thank you. Um, so of course we still want to spread our, our arts and, and our vision um, and also to connect people is is a huge thing for us and, and to show people that possibilities are endless in everything that you do and just being a good person and connecting with people because that's what dance is really about um, and to keep on evolving and and building a community yeah building that community building that energy bring more people to show them how beautiful the dance is I mean, you want to know you, you want to know that you're Canadian of all of our conversations, it's been an hour. You've never said a Canadian accent except just now. A boat. <laughs> <laughs> you messed up, bro. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's like, a boat. <laughs> I guess so. Or that's what it sounds like to an American. Yeah, maybe it sounds like but to us it's just yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah. What's the scene in, in Toronto now? Are there okay. any uh, re uh, rebels that are doing socials or is it on lockdown or what? Okay. <laughs> so Canada is really behind most of the world when it oh. comes to the COVID situation. We are still experiencing lockdowns. We're in lockdown locally. We're locked down internationally. So we're not... Although we can travel, they've imposed restrictions that pretty much make it not feasible to travel whatsoever. Um, so Canada is sort of in its pocket right now, still dealing with COVID and we're still sort of in the thick of things. Um, so there's no scene, technically, no scene. We have not been in the studio for more than a month. Or no, two no, months, October, October. but I'm saying for a month or two months collectively in the full span of the year um, here in Canada, in Toronto, um, we have not seen socials since yeah. March. No legit socials. There yeah. are rebels, of course, everywhere. And there were rebels that last year in the summer were doing, um, you know, socials, hosting socials underground and at, be at the beach and stuff. But yeah. like, you know, organizers promoters we all collectively came together to ensure that like nothing legit would happen and we would like you know abide by like mm -hmm. the restrictions here so there hasn't been a scene we haven't seen social dancing for a very long time mm -hmm. and sadly a lot of the places that we did frequent um in the scene have now closed oh um, so i don't know notably maybe you don't yeah do you know what happened mm -hmm. uh dover courthouse is no more yeah and that was my favorite uh downstairs was kizom banzook right i know yeah oh man yeah so dover court was a hub in our community huge huge for, hit for the whole community yeah. man. that that was the hub for for latin dancing yeah. that socials. was the most devastating hit for yeah. sure when it came like, to our community here yeah you know the great thing about our, our industry is that uh, it opens the door to, to many other things when something closes like that. And, you know, I'm hopeful that we get back to the normalcy of all of this. Uh, the key here is when everyone is vaccinated. Here in the United States, I think 80% are vaccinated already. And that, uh, I, you guys are well ahead, yeah. This here in Nevada and California, it's almost done. Like California, they're now vaccinating 16 and over. And oh Nevada is going to be vaccinated by April 15, 16 and over. So it, that's what it, I we are extremely behind because we haven't gotten out of 80 plus yet. Not good. <laughs> Very limited vaccines. Canada has been struggling with the vaccination on the vaccination front. And we're still, like I said, in 80 plus. So we don't know when that's going to change. They're, they're saying that by June, they'll be able to vaccinate the majority I, I of the population. But 
it's been it's been a bit of a shit show here in Canada, to be honest, with everything COVID related. So I hope I so, guys, because uh, the only festival I'm doing is Hawaii. I'm doing this as an act of faith. Uh, because I don't know what's going to happen. As you know, we are living in the era of unpredictability, as you know. So I don't know. But I just thought that the timing would be great on Halloween weekend where we can just, if we can't dance, we'll just fucking hang out on the beach or something uh, or something. But, uh, you know, I'm just providing this venue, which I already spent 15K of it in the hotel. Uh, but all of the people are inquiring. It's like, hey, you guys want to come? Come, I'll provide you a room, but I can't pay you. <laughs> you know, if you want to teach worship, that's fine. If you just want to social, that's also fine. Let's just Get celebrate to from this shit, you know? Because I'm so tired, man. <laughs> I was like, this is this is what we're technically in jail, right? Yeah, it sucks. It sucks. And like I said, in Canada, we haven't really seen a change to like any sort of normalcy in a long time so it's been really tough here on the mental health of like canadian citizens it's been really tough on businesses yeah um it like our you know our economy has suffered greatly because of the continued lockdown and you know it it's almost like we've gotten to the point where we're tired of being tired so like mm -hmm. we've accepted that this is just what we need to like deal with and and yeah. keep moving yeah, no, we just got to focus on what we can control. But because if we focus on that, we're going to like kill ourselves yeah. mentally, you know what I mean? But we're hopeful, we're hopeful, For sure. you know, that at the very least things, especially with vaccines rolling out as however they roll out, that we start to see improvements in, you know, in life. And, that, life. and that's one thing, the arts is what helps mental health so, yeah. so much. So I know that this is going to be so important for so many people, even people that have never danced before. Yeah. So I'm anticipating that, you know, with everything with the vaccines, that it's going to really change the, the collective of the dance industry afterwards. Yeah, I think so, because, you know, once you have that, then you have this shield already, uh, invisible shield that when you're vaccinated, at least, we can get back to normalcy without fear of, you know, contracting uh, uh, the virus and whatnot. But um, I, I hope so, because I think that the world will be in a better place when, when we have those concerts coming up and when we have this conventions, dance conventions coming up, even just a mini workshop all over. It's in, in our industry, it's what they live for, for some reason, as you can see that when you do your Zoom, you know, it's just almost hard to believe that people are willing to learn by watching because of what's happening now, because they're deprived as you were. But getting back to your Zoom thing, being a psychologist, you got visual, you got oral, and you got kinesthetic as learners. Mm -hmm. Yes. The people that always frequent your, as your students online are visual. They can yeah. learn just by like that. <laughs> there are people like kinesthetic, you gotta actually touch them to learn. It's like you gotta have to do it this way, you know. And oral, that's I mean, they could they could learn from a book for crying out loud. <laughs> just by reading it. So uh uh and you know, uh there is that online, there's that benefit with visual people, and there's a lot of them, but there we cannot forget this other people here, which Hopefully, yeah. when everyone else is vaccinated, they can all gather at the same time. Don't get me wrong; I miss like the uh, you know being with people and the and, energy. It's the yeah. energy and the connection. That's like what we all miss the most about dance. Yeah. That's like, why I have to know, be so crazy. Is being that's able why. to just get together <laughs> on a weekend and shoot yeah, the that's, shit. You know, that's like, wait, 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 both of you. Okay, because I can't teach with my wife. Okay, there's <laughs> just that's just like teaching your kid or teaching your husband how to drive type of thing. You know, it, it, it's just impossible because we are two dominating personalities, okay? It's just, if Isidra thinks that what I'm saying is wrong, she is going to correct me in public. I do not like that <laughs> as a teacher, okay? So when I teach with someone, we, we always have a deal or we don't even have to. Like when I used to teach with Camille, we have this personality that balances, but both of you, she has stronger personalities, but <laughs> but 
how does this work? Do you guys have a deal or something before teaching? Okay. It's, we've worked on it. We've worked on it. Yeah. We've worked on it extensively because we both are very strong personalities. And yeah. when we started just partnering, just uh, as dance partners, <clears throat> learning choreographies, we butt heads a lot. And we didn't see eye to eye at, at all. Yeah. Um, have very different learning styles and very different environments in which we can learn yeah um geo comes from a very well we were both athletes um and we both um felt you know we were both we both came from environments where our parents were very strong disciplined strong and military yes and i think we both Although we had similar upbringings in terms of the discipline that our parents um, provided, right. we both reacted to them or engaged with those disciplines in different ways. Um, Gio was able to meet that discipline headstrong. And so he's very militant in his approach. He's go, go, go. Um, he can bring on the energy, he can turn on the energy, no problem. In any situation or environment, like, he's still able to bring it. Me, it was the opposite. Um, I require a little bit more calm. My like environment has to be more patient. Zen. Uh, yeah, it has to be more patient. And so when Gio and I first started, Gio was very go, go, go. Very like, you know, in my face, very like pushy in terms of like what I needed to deliver. And that didn't bode well with me. So that would make me shut down and that would make me um, retreat. Yes. Like yeah. I would just, like literally fuck this. Like I'm not yeah. doing that. You know what I mean? And so that was our dynamic at the beginning was where like we would try to practice. He would push me too much or he would push my buttons the wrong way. Again, as a psychologist, you can understand, right? Like this comes from trauma, right? Like it comes from our upbringing, childhood, like what we, you know, were exposed to as children. So for me, that my coping mechanism was i'm out like i'm done like i'm not gonna deal with this you know and i took it as a form of too much yeah, <laughs> yeah. but the key there is that you were able to study each other right yeah. and yeah, that's sure. that's what we did over the years we i think the key to our partnership and to understanding each other was open and honest communication we had to really sit down and almost hash it out, talk to each other honestly about, okay, like this is the reason why I don't react well to this, this, and this. And I want you to understand why. Like we had to literally, we were like psychologists. Like we really yeah, were. Like we were, had to. <laughs> we're all psychologists. And it was like, you know, this is why I don't react well. And it was the acknowledgement, the I hear you, and the collective understanding of where we come from what is required for each of us and setting boundaries. and then setting boundaries so, yeah setting boundaries and once we we're able to set those boundaries once we we were able to understand each other the mechanics of how we worked was much easier yeah yeah if, if as if you notice in the psychological sense one of the quote, popular quotes is what we call seek to understand right that's an action word and you are actually the one who needs to approach to understand the other person, not you expecting the person to understand you. Does that make sense? <laughs> and I think common mistake that most humans make is we assume. We assume that the other person understands where we're coming from without us verbalizing what needs to be understood, right? And so, again, Gio and I started this when we were really young. And so... It was, we were very different people then. And again, like we mentioned earlier, we seek to always educate ourselves. And, and we've also studied, you know, elements of like behavior and psychology. And we've done a lot of like self work in terms of dealing with our own individual like traumas and triggers. Yeah. And just from that self work that we were also able to better our partnership because it comes from yourself first. The more that you understand yourself, the more that you appreciate yourself, the more that you're able to appreciate your dynamic with others. Yeah. I mean, okay. I wish that every teachers in our industry 
have a basic knowledge of psychology principles. Oh man. It, it does help a lot. Uh, I've applied a lot of NLP principles in, in teaching yeah. because I love teaching beginners and you know, that's the most challenging one. I love uh, teaching beginners. The two left feet, are you, are you serious? Because most of the time they, let's talk about two left feet for a moment here, who never dance in their life who will always say, I can never do something like that. I can never dance, I have two left feet. That it is right there because they decided they, they can't dance. Yes. You know, yeah. I, and I always tell them, it's like, you can walk every day, right? <laughs> yeah, if you can walk. Nobody even taught you how to walk. It just, you just learned it by yourself, you know? But, um, Look, guys, uh, I want to thank you both because since I met you, uh, I've always been fond of you guys. I've, I've, I've always been a fan uh, of what you have created and, and you have supported my event. There were times where I was struggling right there, as you know, and you understood uh, the way it works in promotion and all that stuff. But you've always been there. You supported and people loved you. And I believe that... Uh, you really got more popular in the United States by bring, when I bring you here. I, I really truly believe that you got you got more recognized now. You're more recognized now because you know they didn't expect that both of you can do mambo and salsa. And not just that, you're not doing basic salsa. You're fucking doing it. You know. <laughs> oh no, we definitely go. I just want to say um, really really quickly. First of all, thank you so much for having us, and secondly. A lot of people don't know, but uh, oh, no, we say it all the time we, when we, we have think, the opportunity. We, yeah. we love and respect you so much. And we appreciate um, the, the faith and the vision that you saw in us yes. back then when you saw it. And you, hey, you know, I'd like for you to come, you know, out to one of my festivals. It was Vegas. The first one was, 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 was yeah. Vegas. Vegas. By when the you, way, that story right there, because I've always thought Kim she has this bubbly personality all the time, right? And you were always been reserved, uh, uh, Gio, every time I talk to you, every <laughs> time I see her, right? Not <laughs> until you guys were doing the Masters Jack and Jill. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there was a pause of the music and Gio's butt popped out like this, like, what the fuck did Gio just do? <laughs> That's when I know, I was like, okay, this guy is just reserved, but he has his moments, you know? <laughs> It's interesting that you say that because most 90% of the people say the opposite. They say that I'm extremely reserved and really quiet and Gio's outgoing, which I think is, is, it's interesting that you say the opposite because I barely get that. Kim, <laughs> you're not, you're not reserved by any means in the psychological aspects of it. If I were to psychoanalyze you, uh, mm -hmm. not just that nobody better messes with you because you're going to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm <laughs> saying that because really, that is true. <laughs> I'm but very anyway, thank you guys. Thank you both. I really appreciate you. We've been talking for half hour or more than half hour, which is the best, right? Because this yeah. is why I do this podcast right here because I just like to talk to old friends who have never talked uh, uh, to all the time and we could chit chat and shit. And there's no, nothing rehearsed or anything. Uh, and that's just the way it is. That's Perfect. Amazing. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much for all your support. We Always love your events. Yes. And guys, you need to head out to Rodney's events. He, he said it first, Hawaii for Halloween. Halloween if you can make it out, get Please, out there. If Even, you're able to leave your country. <laughs> yeah, if, you're able, if you can leave your country, Get out yeah. to Hawaii. And when I bring, and when I bring, uh, when I bring them here in the United States, uh, God willing, when all of these restrictions are over, make sure you attend the workshop. I brought them in Berkeley once, and and oh. uh, I think half of you came. Uh, uh, that's because probably not well uh, uh, promoted at that point. Uh, but it's going to be different now because in our industry, most of the artists are now more popular than ever. Why? Because you guys have been seeking them online because that was the only thing you can do. And that's the only thing you can do at the moment. So in my opinion, this pandemic thing is a blessing in disguise area in our industry, Absolutely. right? So uh, guys, uh, hey, ladies and gents, if you have never subscribed to this podcast, it's on the right side of the screen. Just click subscribe 
and uh, uh, you will never miss an episode. Thank you, Gio and Kim from Toronto, Araguacu. Uh, what's the future of Araguacu? Uh, is there going to be a performance? Is there going to be a team audition or what? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Everything. for sure. We still, Everything. We still, we still run our practices online. We still have our teams. Yeah, we still got our teams. We're going strong. We've oh. been training hard. Our teams are they're coming out like they're coming, coming out, full yeah. blaze so, so i cannot wait guys thank you both i love you both i'll talk to you soon take care bye guys